Act One of The Recruiting Officer by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Recruiting Officer, a comedy in five acts by George Farquhar. Dramatis Personae. Captain Bloom, read by Peter Tucker. Justice Balance, read by Christine G. Mr. Worthy, a gentleman of Shropshire, read by Tricia G. Sergeant Kite, read by Todd. Bullock, a country clown, read by Alan Mapstone. Thomas Appletree, read by Steve Toner. Castor Perlman, read by Zames Curran. Mark, read by Newgate Novelist. Constable, read by Anna Simon. Captain Brazen, read by Negatron. Melinda, a lady of fortune, read by Abai. Rose, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Lucy, by Mary Kay. Sylvia, read by Beth Thomas. Servant, read by John N. Daly. A woman, read by Rapunzelina. Wife, read by Abai. Justice Scrooper, read by Sandra Schmidt. Stuart, read by Steve Toner. Justice Scale, read by Zames Curran. And narrated by Marianne Spiegel. Act the First, Scene One, The Marketplace. Drum beats the Grenadier's March. Enter Sergeant Kite, followed by Thomas Appletree. Costar Pearlmain and the mob. Kite making a speech. If any gentleman soldiers or others have a mind to serve his majesty and pull down the French king, if any apprentices have severe masters, any children have undutiful parents, if any servants have too little wages, or any husband too much wife, let them repair to the noble sergeant kite at the sign of the raven in this good town of shrewsbury and they shall receive present relief and entertainment drum gentlemen i don't beat my drums here to ensnare or inveigle any man for you must know gentlemen that i am a man of honour besides I don't beat up for common soldiers. No, I list only grenadiers. Grenadiers, gentlemen. Pray, gentlemen, observe this cap. This is the cap of honor. It dubs a man a gentleman in the drawing of a trigger. And he that has the good fortune to be born six feet high was born to be a great man. Sir, Will you give me leave to try this cap upon your head? Is there no harm in it? Won't the cap list me? No, no, no more than I can. Come, let me see how it becomes you. Are you sure there's no conjuration in it? No gunpowder plot upon me? No, no, friend, don't fear, man. My mind misgives me plaguely. Let me see it. Going to put it on. It smells woundily of sweat and brimstone. Smell, Tumas. Aye, wounds, does it? Pray, sergeant, what writing is there upon the face of it? Look round, or the bed of honor. Pray now, what may be that same bed of honor? Oh, a mighty large bed, bigger by half than the great bed at Ware. Ten thousand people may lie in it together, and never feel one another. My wife and I would do well to lie in it, for we don't care for feeling one another. But do folks sleep sound in the same bed of honor? Sound? Ay, so sound they never wake. Wands, I wish again that my wife lay there. Say you so, then I find, brother. Brother? Hold there, friend. I am no kindred to you that I know of yet. Look ye, sergeant. No coaxing, no wheedling. D'ye see? 
If I have a mind to list, why so? If not, why tis not so? Therefore, take your cap and your brothership back again, for I am not disposed at this present writing. No coaxing, no brothering me, faith. I coax, I wheedle, I'm above it, sir. I have served twenty campaigns. But, sir, you talk well, and I must own that you are a man, every inch of you, a pretty young sprightly fellow. I love a fellow with a spirit, but I scorn to coax, tis base. Though I must say that never in my life have I seen a man better built. How firm and strong he treads, he steps like a castle. But I scorn to wheedle any man. Come, honest lad, will you take a share of a pot? Nay, for that matter. I'll spend my penny with the best he that wears a head. That is, begging your pardon, sir, and in a fair way. Give me your hand, then. And now, gentlemen, I have no more to say but this. Here's a purse of gold, and there is a tub of humming ale at my quarters. Tis the king's money and the king's drink. He's a generous king and loves his subjects. I hope, gentlemen, you won't refuse the king's health. No, no, no. No, no. Huzzah, then. Huzzah for the king and the honor of Shropshire. Huzzah! Huzzah! Beat drum. Exuant, shouting. Drum beating the grenadiers march. Enter Plume in a riding habit. By the grenadiers march, that should be my drum, and by that shout it should beat with success. Let me see. Four o'clock. Looking on his watch. At ten yesterday morning I left London. A hundred and twenty miles in thirty hours is pretty smart riding. But nothing to the fatigue of recruiting. Enter Kite. Welcome to Shrewsbury, noble captain. From the banks of the Danube to the Severn side, noble captain, you're welcome. A very elegant reception indeed, Mr. Kite. I find you have fairly entered into your recruiting strain. Pray, what success? I've been here a week, and I've recruited five. Five? Pray, what are they? I have listed the strong man of Kent, the king of the gypsies, a Scotch peddler, a scoundrel attorney, and a Welsh parson. An attorney? Wert thou mad? List a lawyer? Discharge him, discharge him this minute. Why, sir? Because I will have nobody in my company that can write. A fellow that can write can draw petitions. I say this minute, discharge him. And what shall I do with the parson? Can he write? Him? He plays rarely upon the fiddle. Keep him, by all means. But how stands the country affected? Were the people pleased with the news of my coming to town? Sir, the mob are so pleased with your honour, and the justices and better sort of people are so delighted with me, that we shall soon do your business. But, sir, you have got a recruit here that you little think of. Who? One that you beat up for the last time you were in the country. You remember your old friend Molly at the castle? She's not with child, I hope. She was brought to bed yesterday. Kite, you must father the child. And so her friends will oblige me to marry the mother. If they should, we'll take her with us. She can wash, you know, and make a bed upon occasion. Aye, or unmake it upon occasion. But your honour knows that I am married already. To how many? I can't tell readily. I have them set down here upon the back of the muster roll. Draws it out. Let me see. Imprimis, Mrs. Shelley Snickerize. She sells potatoes upon Ormond Quay in Dublin. Peggy Guzzle, the brandy woman at the horse guards at Whitehall. Dolly Wagon, the carrier's daughter at Hull. Mademoiselle von Bottomflat at the bus. Then Jenny Oakham, the ship's carpenter's widow, at Portsmouth. But I don't reckon upon her, for she was married at the same time to two lieutenants of marines, and a man of war's boatswain. Full company. You have named five. Come, make them half a dozen. 
Kite, is the child a boy or a girl? A chopping boy. Then set the mother down in your list, and the boy in mine. Enter him a grenadier, by the name of Francis Kite, absent upon furlough. I'll allow you a man's pay for his subsistence, and now go comfort the wench in the straw. I shall, sir. But hold, have you made any use of your fortune-teller's habit since you arrived? Yes, yes, sir, and my fame's all about the county for the most faithful fortune-teller that ever told a lie. I was obliged to let my landlord into the secret, for the convenience of keeping it so, but he is an honest fellow, and will be faithful to any roguery that is trusted to him. This device, sir, will get you men, and me, money, which I think is all we want at present. But yonder comes your friend, Mr. Worthy. Has your honor any further commands? None at present. Exit Kite. Tis indeed the picture of Worthy, but the life is departed. Enter Worthy. What, arms across, Worthy? Methinks you should hold them open when a friend's so near. The man has got vapours in his ears, I believe. I must expel this melancholy spirit. Spleen, thou worst of fiends below, fly, I conjure thee, by this magic blow. Slaps Worthy on the shoulder. Plume, my dear captain, welcome. Safe and sound returned. I escaped safe from Germany, and sound, I hope, from London. You see, I have lost neither leg, arm, nor nose. Then for my inside tis neither troubled with sympathies nor antipathies, and I have an excellent stomach for roast beef. Thou art a happy fellow. Once I was so. What ails thee, man? No inundations nor earthquakes in Wales, I hope. Has your father rose from the dead and reassumed his estate? No. Then you are married, surely. No. Then you are mad, or turning Quaker. Come, I must out with it. Your once gay, roving friend is dwindled into an obsequious, thoughtful, romantic, constant coxcomb. And pray, what is all this for? For a woman. Shake hands, brother. If you go to that, behold me as obsequious, as thoughtful, and as constant a coxcomb as your worship. For whom? For a regiment. But for a woman? Steth! I've been constant to fifteen at a time, but never melancholy for one. And can the love of one bring you into this condition? Pray, who is this wonderful Helen? A Helen, indeed. Not to be one under ten years' siege. As great a beauty, and as great a jilt. A jilt? Phew. Is she as great a whore? No, no. Tis ten thousand pities. But who is she? Do I know her? Very well. That's impossible. I know no woman that will hold out a ten years' siege. What think you of Melinda? Melinda! Why, she began to capitulate this time twelve months, and offered to surrender upon honourable terms. And I advised you to propose a settlement of five hundred pounds a year to her, before I went last abroad. I did, and she hearkened to it, desiring only one week to consider, when beyond her hopes the town was relieved, and I forced to turn the siege into a blockade. Explain, explain. My lady richly, her aunt in Flincher, dies, and leaves her, at this critical time, twenty thousand pounds. Oh, the devil! What a delicate woman was there spoilt! But by the rules of war now... Worthy, blockade was foolish. After such a convoy of provisions was entered the place, you could have no thought of reducing it by famine. You should have redoubled your attacks, taken the town by storm, or have died upon the breach. I did make one general assault, but was so vigorously repulsed that, despairing of ever gaining her for a mistress, I have altered my conduct, given my addresses the obsequious and distant turn, and court her now for a wife. So, as you grew obsequious, she grew haughty, and because you approached her like a goddess, 
she used you like a dog exactly tis the way of them all come worthy your obsequious and distant airs will never bring you together you must not think to surmount her pride by your humility would you bring her to better thoughts of you she must be reduced to a meaner opinion of herself let me see the very first thing that i would do should be to lie with her chambermaid and hire three or four wenches in the neighbourhood to report that i had got them with child suppose we lampooned all the pretty women in town and left her out or what if we made a ball and forgot to invite her with one or two of the ugliest these would be mortifications i must confess but we live in such a precise dull place that we can have no balls no lampoons no what no bastards and so many recruiting officers in town i thought twas a maxim among them to leave as many recruits in the country as they carried out nobody doubts your good will noble captain in serving your country witness our friend molly at the castle there have been tears in town about that business captain i hope sylvia has not heard of it oh sir have you thought of her i began to fancy you had forgot poor sylvia your affairs had quite put mine out of my head tis true sylvia and i had once agreed to go to bed together could we have adjusted preliminaries but she would have the wedding before consummation and i was for consummation before the wedding we could not agree but do you intend to marry her upon no other conditions your pardon sir i'll marry upon no condition at all if i should i am resolved never to bind myself down to a woman for my whole life till i know whether i shall like her company for half an hour suppose i married a woman without a leg such a thing might be unless i examined the goods beforehand if people would but try one another's constitutions before they engaged it would prevent all these elopements divorces and the devil knows what nay for that matter the town did not stick to say that i hate country towns for that reason if your town has a dishonourable thought of sylvia it deserves to be burnt to the ground i love sylvia i admire her frank generous disposition there's something in that girl more than woman in short were i once a general i would marry her faith you have reason for were you but a corporal she would marry you but my melinda coquettes it with every fellow she sees i'll lay fifty pounds she makes love to you i'll lay you a hundred that i return it if she does look ye worthy i'll win her and give her to you afterwards if you win her you shall wear her faith i would not value the conquest without the credit of the victory enter kite captain captain a word in your ear you may speak out here are none but friends you know sir that you sent me to comfort the good woman in the straw mrs molly uh, my wife mr worthy oh ho very well i wish you joy mr kite your worship very well may for i have got both a wife and a child in half an hour but as i was saying you sent me to comfort mrs molly uh, my wife i mean but what do you think sir she was better comforted before i came as how why sir a footman in a blue livery had brought her ten guineas to buy her baby clothes who in the name of wonder could send them nay sir i must whisper that mrs sylvia sylvia generous creature sylvia impossible here are the guineas sir i took the gold as part of my wife's portion nay farther sir she sent word the child should be taken all imaginable care of and that she intended to stand godmother the same footman as i was coming to you with this news called after me and told me that his lady would speak to me i went and upon hearing that you were come to town she gave me half a guinea for the news and ordered me to tell you that justice balance her father who was just come out of the country would be glad to see you there's a girl for you worthy is there anything of woman in this no tis noble generous manly friendship 
show me another woman that would lose an inch of her prerogative that way without tears fits and reproaches the common jealousy of her sex which is nothing but their avarice of pleasure she despises and can part with the lover though she dies for the man come worthy where's the best wine for there i'll quarter at horton's let's away then mr kite go to the lady with my humble service and tell her i shall only refresh a little and wait upon her hold kite have you seen the other recruiting captain no sir i'd have you to know i don't keep such company another who is he my rival in the first place and the most unaccountable fellow but i'll tell you more as we go Exuant. scene two an apartment melinda and sylvia meeting welcome to town cousin sylvia salute i envied you your retreat in the country for shrewsbury methinks and all your heads of shires are the most irregular places for living here we have smoke scandal affectation and pretension in short everything to give the spleen and nothing to divert it then the air is intolerable oh madam i have heard the town commended for its air but you don't consider sylvia how long i have lived in it for i can assure you that to a lady the least nice in her constitution no air can be good above half a year change of air i take to be the most agreeable of any variety in life as you say cousin melinda there are several sorts of airs Psha! i talk only of the air we breathe or more properly of that we taste have you not sylvia found a vast difference in the taste of airs pray cousin are not vapours a sort of air taste air you might as well tell me i may feed upon air but prithee my dear melinda don't put on such an air to me your education and mine were just the same and i remember the time when we never troubled our heads about air but when the sharp air from the welsh mountains made our fingers ache in a cold morning at the boarding school our education cousin was the same but our temperaments had nothing alike you have the constitution of a horse so far as to be troubled neither with spleen colic nor vapours i need no salts for my stomach no hartshorn for my head nor wash for my complexion i can gallop all the morning after the hunting horn and all the evening after a fiddle in short i can do everything with my father but drink and shoot flying and i am sure i can do everything my mother could were i put to the trial you are in a fair way of being put to it for i am told your captain is come to town ay melinda he is come and i'll take care he shan't go without a companion you are certainly mad cousin and there's a pleasure in being mad which none but madmen know thou poor romantic quixote hast thou the vanity to imagine that a young sprightly officer that rambles o'er half the globe in half a year can confine his thoughts to the little daughter of a country justice in an obscure part of the world sure what care i for his thoughts i should not like a man with confined thoughts it shows a narrowness of soul in short melinda i think a petticoat a mighty simple thing and i am heartily tired of my sex that is you are tired of an appendix to our sex that you can't so handsomely get rid of in petticoats as if you were in breeches on my conscience sylvia hadst thou been a man thou hadst been the greatest rake in christendom i should have endeavoured to know the world which a man can never do thoroughly without half a hundred friendships and as many amours but now i think on't how stands your affair with mr worthy he's my aversion vapours what do you say madam i say that you should not use that honest fellow so inhumanly he's a gentleman of parts and fortune and besides that he's my plume's friend and by all that's sacred if you don't use him better i shall expect satisfaction satisfaction you begin to fancy yourself in breeches in good earnest but to be plain with you i like worthy the worse for being so intimate with your captain for i take him to be a loose idle unmannerly coxcomb oh madam you never saw him perhaps since you were mistress of twenty thousand pounds you only knew him when you were capitulating with worthy for a settlement which perhaps might encourage him to be a little loose and unmannerly with you 
What do you mean, madam? My meaning needs no interpretation, madam. Better it had, madam, for methinks you are too plain. If you mean the plainness of my person, I think your ladyship's as plain as me to the full. Were I sure of that, I would be glad to take up with a rake officer, as you do. Again, look ye, madam, you are in your own house. And if you had kept in yours, I should have excused you. Don't be troubled, madam. I shan't desire to have my visit returned. The sooner, therefore, you make an end of this, the better. I am easily persuaded to follow my inclinations, and so, madam, your humble servant. Exit. Saucy thing. Enter Lucy. What's the matter, madam? Did you not see the proud nothing, how she swelled upon the arrival of her fellow? Her fellow has not been long enough arrived, to occasion any great swelling, madam. I don't believe she has seen him yet. Nor shan't, if I can help it. Let me see. I have it. Bring me pen and ink. Hold, I'll go right in my closet. An answer to this letter, I hope, madam. Presents a letter. Who sent it? Your captain, madam. He's a fool, and I'm tired of him. Send it back unopened. The messenger's gone, madam. Then how shall I send an answer? <sighs> Call him back immediately while I go right. Excellent. End of Act One Act Two of The Recruiting Officer by George Farquhar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Second Scene One An Apartment Enter Justice Balance and Plume Look, I, Captain, give us but blood for our money, and you shan't want men. Adds my life, Captain, get us but another marshal of France, and I'll go myself for a soldier. Pray, Mr. Balance, how does your fair daughter? Ah, Captain, what is my daughter to a marshal of France? Or upon a nobler subject, I want to have a particular description of the last battle. The battle, sir, was a very pretty battle, as any one should desire to see. But we were all so intent upon victory that we never minded the battle. All that I know of the matter is, our general commanded us to beat the French, and we did so. And if he pleases but to say the word, we'll do it again. But pray, sir, how does Mrs. Sylvia? Still upon Sylvia. For shame, Captain. You are engaged already. Wedded to the war. Victory is your mistress, and tis below a soldier to think of any other. As a mistress, I confess. But as a friend, Mr. Balance— Come, come, Captain, never mince the matter. Would not you seduce my daughter if you could? Oh, sir, I hope she is not to be seduced. Faith, but she is, sir, and any woman in England of her age and complexion, by your youth and vigour. Look, I, Captain, once I was young and once an officer, as you are, and I can guess at your thoughts now by what mine were then— and I remember very well that I would have given one of my legs to have deluded the daughter of an old country gentleman like me, as I was then like you. But, sir, was that country gentleman your friend and benefactor? Not much of that. There the comparison breaks. The favours, sir, that— Foe, foe. I had said speeches. If I had done you any service, Captain, it was to please myself. I love thee, and if I could part with my girl, you should have her as soon as any young fellow I know. But I hope you have more honour than to quit the service, and she more prudence than to follow the camp. But she's at her own disposal. She has five thousand pounds in her pocket, and so— Calls. Sylvia! Sylvia! Enter Sylvia. There are some letters, sir, come by the post from London. I left them upon the table in your closet. And here is a gentleman from Germany. Presents Plume to her. Captain, you'll excuse me. I'll go read my letters and wait on you. Exit. Sir, you are welcome to England. You are indebted to me a welcome, madam, since the hopes of receiving it from this fair hand was the principal cause of my seeing England. I have often heard that soldiers were sincere. May I venture to believe public report? You may, when it is backed by private insurance. For I swear, madam, by the honour of my profession, 
that whatever dangers i went upon it was with the hope of making myself more worthy of your esteem and if i ever had thoughts of preserving my life twas for the pleasure of dying at your feet well well you shall die at my feet or where you will but you know sir there is a certain will and testament to be made beforehand my will madam is made already and there it is and if you please to open that parchment which was drawn the evening before the battle of hoxted you will find whom i left my heir mrs sylvia balance opens the will and reads well captain this is a handsome and substantial compliment but i can assure you i am much better pleased with the bare knowledge of your intention than i should have been in the possession of your legacy but methinks sir you should have left something to your little boy at the castle aside that's home my little boy lack a day madam that alone may convince you twas none of mine why the girl madam is my sergeant's wife and so the poor creature gave out that i was the father in hopes that my friends might support her in case of necessity that was all madam <laughs> my boy no 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 enter a servant madam my master has received some ill news from london and desires to speak with you immediately and he begs the captain's pardon that he can't wait on him as promised ill news heavens avert it nothing could touch me nearer than to see that generous worthy gentleman afflicted i'll leave you to comfort him and be assured that if my life and fortune can be any way serviceable to the father of my sylvia he shall freely command both the necessity must be very pressing that would engage me to endanger either excellent severally scene two another apartment enter balance and sylvia whilst there is life there is hope sir perhaps my brother may recover we have but little reason to expect it the doctor acquaints me here that before this comes to my hands he fears i shall have no son poor owen but a decree is just i was pleased with the death of my father because he left me an estate and now i am punished with the loss of an heir to inherit mine i must now look upon you as the only hopes of my family and i expect that the argumentation of your fortune will give you fresh thoughts and new prospects my desire in being punctual in my obedience requires that you would be plain in your command sir the death of your brother makes you sole heiress to my estate which you know is about three thousand pounds a year this fortune gives you a fair claim to quality and a title you must set a just value upon yourself and in plain terms think no more of captain plume you have often commended the gentleman sir and i do so still he is a very pretty fellow but though i liked him well enough for a bare son-in-law i don't approve of him for an heir to my estate and family five thousand pounds indeed i might trust in his hands and it might do the young fellow a kindness but odds my life three thousand pounds a year would ruin him quite turn his brain a captain of foot worth three thousand pounds a year tis a prodigy in nature enter a servant sir here's one with a letter below for your worship but he will deliver it into no hands but your own come show me the messenger exit with servant make the dispute between love and duty and i am prince pretty man exactly if my brother dies ah poor brother if he lives ah poor sister it is bad both ways i'll try it again follow my own inclinations and break my father's heart or obey his commands and break my own worse and worse suppose i take it thus a moderate fortune a pretty fellow and a pad or a fine estate a coach and six and an ass oh, that will never do either enter balance and a servant to a servant who goes out put four horses to the coach ho sylvia sir how old were you when your mother died so young that i don't remember i ever had one and you have been so careful so indulgent to me since that indeed i never wanted one have i ever denied you anything you asked of me never that i remember then sylvia i must beg that once in your life you will grant me a favour why should you question it sir i don't but i would rather counsel than command i don't propose this with the authority of a parent but ask the advice of your friend that you would take the coach this moment and go into the country does this advice sir proceed from the contents of the letter you received just now 
No matter. I will be with you in three or four days, and then give you my reasons. But before you go, I expect you will make me one solemn promise. Propose the thing, sir. That you will never dispose of yourself to any man without my consent. I promise. Very well. And to be even with you, I promise I never will dispose of you without your own consent. And so, Sylvia, the coach is ready. Farewell. Leads her to the door and returns. Now she is gone, to examine the contents of this letter a little nearer. Reads. Sir, my intimacy with Mr. Worthy has drawn a secret from him, that he had from his friend Captain Plume, and my friendship and relation to your family oblige me to give you timely notice of it. The captain has dishonourable designs upon my cousin Sylvia. Evils of this nature are more easily prevented than amended, and that you would immediately send my cousin into the country is the advice of, Sir, your humble servant, Melinda. Why, the devils in the young fellows of this age! They are ten times worse than they were in my time. Had he made my daughter a whore, and forswore it like a gentleman, I could almost have pardoned it. But to tell tales beforehand is monstrous. Hang it, I can fetch down a woodcock or a snipe, and why not a hat and a cockade? I have a case of good pistols, and have a good mind to try. Enter Worthy. Worthy, your servant. I'm sorry, sir, to be the messenger of ill news. I apprehended it, sir. You have heard that my son Owen is past recovery. My letters say he's dead, sir. He's happy, and I am satisfied. The stroke of heaven I can bear, but injuries from men, Mr. Worthy, are not so easily supported. I hope, sir, you are under no apprehensions of wrong from anybody. You know I ought to be. You wrong my honour in believing I could know anything to your prejudice without resenting it as much as you should. This letter, sir, which I tear in pieces to conceal the person that sent it, informs me that Plume has a design upon Sylvia, and that you are privy to it. Nay, then, sir, I must do myself justice, and endeavour to find out the author. Takes up a bit. Sir, I know the hand, and if you refuse to discover the contents, Melinda shall tell me. Going. Hold, sir. The contents I have told you already, only with this circumstance, that her intimacy with Mr. Worthy had drawn a secret from him. Her intimacy with me? Dear sir, let me pick up the pieces of this letter, twill give me such a power over her pride to have her own an intimacy under her hand. This was the luckiest accident. Gathering up the letter. The aspersion, sir, was nothing but malice, the effect of a little quarrel between her and Mrs. Sylvia. Are you sure of that, sir? Her maid gave me the history of part of the battle just now, as she overheard it. But I hope, sir, your daughter has suffered nothing upon the account. No, no, poor girl. She's so afflicted with the news of her brother's death that, to avoid company, she begged leave to go into the country. And is she gone? I could not refuse her. She was so pressing. The coach went from the door the minute before you came. So pressing to be gone, sir? I find her fortune will give her the same airs with Melinda, and then Plume and I may laugh at one another. Like enough. Women are as subject to pride as men are. And why mayn't great women as well as great men forget their old acquaintance? But come, where is this young fellow? I love him so well, it would break the heart of me to think him a rascal. Aside. I am glad my daughter's gone fairly off, though. Where does the captain quarter? At Horton's. I am to meet him there two hours hence, and we should be glad of your company. Your pardon, dear worthy. I must allow a day or two to the death of my son. The decorum of mourning is what we owe the world, because they pay it to us. Afterwards I am yours over a bottle, or how you will. Sir, I am your humble servant. Excellent apart. Scene three. The street. Enter Kite, with Costar Pearlman in one hand, and Thomas Appletree in the other, drunk. Kite sings. Our prentice Tom may now refuse to wipe his scoundrel's master's shoes, for now he's free to sing and play over the hills and far away. Over the hills and far away. We shall lead more happy lives by getting rid of brats and wives that scold and brawl both night and day over the hills and far away. Over, over the, the hills, hills and far away. Hey, boys, thus we soldiers live, 
drink sing dance play we live as one should say we live tis impossible to tell how we live we are all princes why why you are a king you are an emperor and i'm a prince now ain't we no sergeant there'll be no emperor no i'll be a justice of the peace a justice of peace man i once will i for since this pressing act they are greater than any emperor under the sun done you are a justice of peace and you are a king and i am a duke and rum duke ain't i i'll be a queen a queen i of england that's greater than any king of them all bravely said faith huzzah for the queen huzzah, huzzah! but harkee you mr justice and you mr queen did you ever see the king's picture no 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 no, no. no. i wonder at that i have two of them set in gold and as like his majesty god bless the mark see here they are set in gold takes two broad pieces out of his pocket presents one to each the wonderful works of nature looking at it what's this written about here's a posy i believe carolus what's that sergeant oh carolus why carolus is latin for king george that's all tis a fine thing to be a scholar sergeant will you part with this i'll buy it on you if you come within the compass of a crown a crown never talk of buying tis the same thing among friends you know i'll present them to ye both you shall give me as good a thing put them up and remember your old friend when i am over the hills and far away they sing and put up the money enter plume singing over the hills and over the main to flanders portugal or spain the king commands that we'll obey over the hills and far away come on my men of mirth away with it i'll make one among you who are these hearty lads off with your hats rounds off with your hats this is the captain the captain we have seen captains afore now man ay and lieutenant captains too it's flesh i'll keep on my nab and i scarcely doff mine for any captain in england me veller's a freeholder who are those jolly lads sergeant a couple of honest brave fellows that are willing to serve the king i have entertained them just now as volunteers under your honor's command and good entertainment they shall have volunteers are the men i want those are the men fit to make soldiers captains generals wounds tumus what's this are you listed what not i are you custer wounds not i what not listed <laughs> a very good jest in faith come thomas we'll go home ay ay come home for shame gentlemen behave yourselves better before your captain dear thomas honest coster no no we'll be gone nay then i command you to stay i place you both sentinels in this place for two hours to watch the motion of st mary's clock you and you the motion of st chad's and he that dares stir from his post till he be relieved shall have my sword in his guts the next minute what's the matter sergeant i'm afraid you are too rough with these gentlemen i'm too mild sir they disobey command sir and one of them should be shot as an example to the other shot Thomas, come gentlemen what's the matter we don't know the noble sergeant is pleased to be in a passion sir but they disobey command they deny their being listed nay sergeant we don't downright deny it neither that we dare not do for fear of being shot but we humbly conceive in a civil way and begging your worship's pardon uh, that we may go home that's easily known have either of you received any of the king's money 
Not a breath farthing, sir. They have each of them received one and twenty shillings, and is now in their pockets. Wounds! If I have a penny in my pocket but a bent sixpence, I'll be content to be listed and shot into the bargain. And I, look ye here, sir. Nothing but the king's pitcher that the surgeon gave me just now. See there, a guinea, one and twenty shillings. T'other has the fellow on't. The case is plain, gentlemen. The goods are found upon you. Those pieces of gold are worth one and twenty shillings each. So it seems that Carolus is one and twenty shillings in Latin. Tis the same thing in Greek, for we are listed. Flesh, but we ain't, Tumas. I desire to be carried before the mayor, Captain. Captain and Sergeant whisper the while. It will never do, Kite. Your damned tricks will ruin me at last. I won't lose the fellows, though, if I can help it. Well, gentlemen, there must be some trick in this. My sergeant offers to take his oath that you are fairly listed. Why, Captain, we know that you soldiers have more liberty of conscience than other folks. But for me and neighbor Custer here to take such an oath, it would be downright perjuration. Look, ye rascal, you villain! If I find that you have imposed upon these two honest fellows, I'll trample you to death, you dog! Come, how was't? Nay, then, we'll speak. Your sergeant, as you say, is a rogue, and like your worship, begging your worship's pardon, and... Nay, Tumas, let me speak. You know I can read. And so, sir, he gave us those two pieces of money for pictures of the king, by the way of a present. How? By way of a present? The son of a whore! I'll teach him to abuse honest fellows like you! Scoundrel! Rogue! Villain! Beats off the sergeant, and follows. A oh, brave noble captain! Huzzah! A, a brave, brave captain! captain. Faith. Faith! Now, Thomas, Carlos is Latin for a beating. This is the bravest captain I ever saw. Wounds! I have a month's mind to go with him. Enter Plume. A dog to abuse two such honest fellows as you. Looky, gentlemen, I love a pretty fellow. I come among you as an officer to list soldiers, not as a kidnapper to steal slaves. Mind that, Tumas. I desire no man to go with me but as I went myself. I went a volunteer, as you or you may do. For a little time carried a musket, and now I command a company. Mind that, Custer, a sweet gentleman. Tis true, gentlemen, I might take an advantage of you. The king's money was in your pockets. My sergeant was ready to take his oath you were listed. But I scorn to do a base thing. You are both of you at your liberty. Thank you, noble captain. I could. I can't find it in my heart to leave him. He talks so finely. I, Custer, will you always hold in this mind? Come, my lads, one thing more I'll tell you. You're both young, tight fellows, and the army is the place to make you men forever. Every man has his lot, and you have yours. What think you of a purse of French gold out of a monsieur's pocket, after you have dashed out his brains with the butt-end of your firelock, eh? Wands. I'll have it. Captain, give me a shilling. I'll follow you to the end of the earth. Nay, dear Custer, dunna. Be advised. Here, my hero, here are two guineas for thee, as earnest of what I'll do farther for thee. Dunna take it, dunna, dear Custer. Cries, and pulls back his arm. I will, I will. Once, my mind gives me that I shall be a captain myself. I take your money, sir, and now I am a gentleman. Give me thy hand. And now you and I will travel the world o'er, and command it wherever we tread. Aside. Bring your friend with you, if you can. Well, Thomas, must we part? No, Custer, I cannot leave thee. Come, Captain, I'll even go along too. And if you have two honest or simpler lads in your company than we two have been, I'll say no more. Here, my lad. Gives him money. Now, your name? 
Thomas Appletree. And yours? Costar Permain. Well said, Costar. Born where? Both in Herefordshire. Very well. Courage, my lads. Now we'll over the hills and far away. Courage, boys, it's one to ten. But we return, all gentlemen, while conquering colours we display over the hills and far away. O'er the hills and o'er the main, to Flanders, Portugal, or Spain, the king commands and will obey. O'er the hills and far away. We shall lead more happy lives by getting rid of brats and wives that scold and brawl both night and day over the hills and far away. Kite! Enter Kite. Take care of them. Ain't you a couple of pretty fellows now? Here you have complained to the captain. I am to be turned out and one of you will be sergeant. Which of you is to have my halbert? I. I. So you shall in your guts. March, you sons of whores. Beats them off. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Recruiting Officer by George Fakahar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Third, Scene One, The Marketplace. Enter Plume and Worthy. I cannot forbear admiring the equality of our fortunes. We love two ladies, they meet us halfway, and just as we were upon the point of leaping into their arms, fortune drops in their laps, pride possesses their hearts, a maggot fills their heads, madness takes them by the tails. They snort, kick up their heels, and away they run. And leave us here to mourn upon the shore, a couple of poor melancholy monsters. What should we do? I have a trick for mine, the letter you know, and the fortune teller. And I have a trick for mine. What is it? I'll never think of her again. No. No, I think myself above administering to the pride of any woman were she worth twelve thousand a year. And I ain't the vanity to believe I shall gain a lady worth twelve hundred. The generous, good-natured Sylvia in her smock I admire, but the haughty and scornful Sylvia with her fortune I despise. What? Sneak out of town? Not so much as a word, a line, a compliment. Steth, how far off does she live? I'll go and break her windows. Ha, ha, ha. Aye, and the window bars, too, to come at her. Come, come, friend, no more of your rough military airs. Enter Kite. Captain, Captain, sir, come yonder. She's a-coming this way. Tis the prettiest, cleanest little tit. Now, worthy, to show you how much I'm in love, here she comes. But, Kite, what is that great country fellow with her? I can't tell, sir. Enter Rose, followed by her brother Bullock, with chickens on her arm in a basket. Boy chickens, young and tender chickens, young and tender chickens. Hear yeah, you chickens. Who calls? Come hither, pretty maid. Will you please to buy, sir? Yes, child, we'll both buy. Nay, worthy, that's not fair. Mark it for yourself. Come, child, I'll buy all you have. Then all I have is at your service. Courtesies. Then I must shift for myself, I find. Exit. Let me see. Young and tender, you say? Chucks her under the chin. As ever you tasted in your life, sir. Come, I must examine your basket to the bottom, my dear. Nay, for that matter, put in your hand. Feel, sir. I warrant my wares as good as any in the market. And I'll buy it all, child, were it ten times more. Sir, I can furnish you. Come then, we won't quarrel about the price. They're fine birds. Pray, what's your name, pretty creature? Rose, sir. My father is a farmer within three short miles of the town. We keep this market. I sell chickens, eggs and butter, and my brother Bullock there sells corn. 
Come, sister, haste. We shall be late home. Whistles about the stage. Kite! Tips him the wink. He returns it. Pretty Mrs. Rose, you have... Let me see. How many? A dozen, sir, and they are richly worth a crown. Come, Rose. I sold fifty streak of barley today and half this time. But you will eagle and eagle for a penny more than the commodity is worth. What's that to you, oaf? I can make as much out of a groat as you can out of fourpence, I'm sure. The gentleman bids fair, and when I meet with a chapman, I know how to make the best of him. And so, sir, I say for a crown piece the bargain's yours. Here's a guinea, my dear. I can't change your money, sir. Indeed, indeed, but you can. My lodging is hard by, chicken, and we'll make change there goes off she follows him so sir as i was telling you i have seen one of these hussars eat up a ravelin for his breakfast and afterwards pick his teeth with a palisado ay you soldiers see very strange things but pray sir what is a ravelin why tis like a modern minced pie but the crust is confounded hard and the plums are somewhat hard of digestion then your palisado pray what may he be come rouse pray have done your palisado is a pretty sort of bodkin about the thickness of my leg aside that's a fib i believe eh where's rouse 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 Slesh. where's rouse gone she's gone with the captain the captain wounds there's no pressing of women sure but there is sure if the captain should press rose i should be ruined which way went she oh the devil take your rabblings and palisados exit you shall be better acquainted with them honest bullock or i shall miss of my aim enter worthy why, thou art the most useful fellow in nature to your captain, admirable in your way, I find. Yes, sir, I understand my business, I will say it. How came you so qualified? You must know, sir, I was born a gypsy, and bred among that crew till I was ten years old. There I learned Canton and Lyon. I was bought from my mother Cleopatra by a certain nobleman for three pistoles. There I learned impudence and pimping. I was turned off for wearing my lord's linen, and drinking my lady's ratafia, and turned bailiff's follower. There I learned bullying and swearing. I at last got into the army, and there I learned whoring and drinking. So that, if your worship pleases to cast up the whole sum, viz. canting, lying, impudence, pimping, bullying, swearing, whoring, drinking, and a halbert, you will find the sum total amount to a recruiting sergeant. And pray, what induced you to turn soldier? Hunger and ambition. But here comes Justice Balance. Enter Balance and Bullock. Hear you, Sergeant. Where's your captain? Here's a poor foolish fellow who comes clamouring to me with a complaint that your captain has pressed his sister. Do you know anything of this matter, Worthy? <laughs> I know his sister is gone with Plume to his lodging to sell him some chickens. Is that all? The fellow's a fool. I know that, and please your worship, but if your worship pleases to grant me a warrant to bring her before your worship, for fear of the worst. Thou art mad, fellow. Thou sister's safe enough. Aside. I hope so, too. Hast thou no more sense, fellow, than to believe that the captain can list women? I know not whether they list them or what they do with them. But I'm sure they carry as many women as men with them out of the country. But how came you not to go along with your sister? Lord, sir, I thought no more of her going than I do of the day I shall die. But this gentleman here, not suspecting any hurt neither, I believe, you thought no harm, friend, did you? Lack a day, sir, not I. Only that I believe I shall marry her to-morrow. 
I begin to smell powder. Well, friend, but what did that gentleman with you? Why, sir, he entertained me with a fine story of a great sea fight between the Hungarians, I think it was, and the wild Irish. And so, sir, while we were in the heat of battle, the captain carried off the baggage. Sergeant, go along with this fellow to your captain. Give in my humble service and desire him to discharge the wench, though he has listed her. Ay, and if she bent free for that, he shall have another man in her place. Come, honest friend, you shall go to my quarters instead of the captain's. Excellent Kite and Bullock We must get his mad captain his complement of men, and send him packing, else he'll overturn the country. You see, sir, how little he values your daughter's disdain. I like him better. I was just such another fellow at his age. But how goes your affair with Melinda? Very slowly. My mistress has got a captain, too. But such a captain! As I live, yonder he comes. Who? The bluff fellow in the sash? I don't know him. But I engage he knows you and everybody at first sight. His impudence were a prodigy, were not his ignorance proportionable. He has the most universal acquaintance of any man living, for he won't be alone, and nobody will keep him company twice. Then he's a Caesar among the women, veni vidi vici, that's all. If he has but talked with the maid, he swears he has lain with the mistress. But the most surprising part of his character is his memory, which is the most prodigious and the most trifling in the world. I have known another acquire so much by travel as to tell you the names of most places in Europe, with their distances of miles, leagues, or hours as punctually as a postboy, but for anything else as ignorant as the horse that carries the mail. This is your man, sir, add but the traveller's privilege of lying, and even that he abuses. This is the picture, behold the life. Enter Brazen. Mr. Worthy, I'm your servant, and so forth. Hark ye, my dear. Whispering, sir, before company is not manners, and when nobody's by, tis foolish. Company? Mort de ma vie! I beg the gentleman's pardon. Who is he? Ask him. So I will. My dear, I am your servant, and so forth. Your name, my dear? Very laconic, sir. Laconic? A very good name, truly. I have known several of the laconics abroad. Oh, poor Jack Laconic. He was killed at the Battle of Landon. I remember that he had a blue ribbon in his hat that very day, and after he fell we found a piece of neat's tongue in his pocket. Pray, sir, did the French attack us, or we them at Landon? The French attack us? Ha! <laughs> no, sir, we attacked them on the... I have reason to remember the time, for I had two and twenty horses killed under me that day. Then, sir, you must have rid mighty hard. Or perhaps, sir, like my countrymen, you rid upon half a dozen horses at once. What do you mean, gentlemen? I tell you they were killed, all torn to pieces by cannon shot, except six I stalked to death upon the enemy's chevaux de frise. Noble captain, may I crave your name? Brazen, at your service. Oh, Brazen, a very good name. I have known several of the Brazens abroad. Do you know one Captain Plume, sir? Is he anything related to Frank Plume in Northamptonshire? Honest Frank, many, many a dry bottle have we cracked hand to fist. You must have known his brother Charles, that was concerned in the India Company. He married the daughter of old Tongue-Pad, the master in Chancery, a very pretty woman, only she quented a little. She died in childbed of her first child, but the child survived. "'Twas a daughter, but whether it was called Margaret or Marjorie, upon my soul, I can't remember. "'Looking on his watch. "'But, gentlemen, I must meet a lady, a twenty-thousand-pounder, presently upon the walk by the water. "'Worthy, your servant. Laconic, yours. "'Exit. "'If you can have so mean an opinion of Melinda, as to be jealous of this fellow, I think she ought to give you cause to be so.' I don't think she encourages him so much for gaining herself a lover as to set up a rival. Were there any credit to be given to his words, I should believe Melinda had made him this assignation. I must go see, sir. You'll pardon me. Exit. Aye, aye, sir. You're a man of business. But what have you got here? 
Enter Rose, singing. And I shall be a lady, a captain's lady, and ride single upon a white horse with a star, upon a velvet side saddle, and I shall go to London and see the tombs and the lions and the king and queen. Sir, and please your worship, I have often seen your worship ride through our grounds a-hunting, begging your worship's pardon. Pray, what may this lace be worth a yard? Showing some lace. Right, Mecklin, by this light. Where did you get this lace, child? No matter for that, sir. I came honestly by it. I question it much. And see here, sir, a fine turkey shell snuff box and fine mangier. See here. Takes snuff affectedly. The captain learned me how to take it with an air. Oh ho! The captain! Now the murder's out. And so the captain taught you to take it with an air. Yes, and give it with an air too. Will your worship please to taste my snuff? Offers the box affectedly. You are a very apt scholar, pretty maid. And pray, what did you give the captain for these fine things? He's to have my brother for a soldier, and two or three sweethearts I have in the country. They shall all go with the captain. Oh, he's the finest man, and the humblest withal. Would you believe it, sir? He carried me up with him to his own chamber, with as much fam... mam... mil... yararality as if I had been the best lady in the land. Oh, he's a mighty familiar gentleman as can be. Enter Plume, singing. But it is not so with those that go through frost and snow, most apropos, my maid with a milking pail. Takes hold of Rose. How? The justice! Then I'm arraigned, condemned, and executed. Oh, my noble captain. And my noble captain too, sir. Steth! Child, are you mad? Mr. Balance, I'm so full of business about my recruits that I haven't a moment's time to... I have just now three or four people to... Nay, Captain, I must speak to you. And so must I too, Captain. Any other time, sir, I cannot for my life, sir... Pray, sir. Twenty thousand things. I would... But now, sir, pray. Devil take me. I cannot... I must... Breaks away. Nay, I'll follow you. Exit. And I too. Exit. Scene two. The walk by the Severn side. Enter Melinda and her maid Lucy. And pray, was it a ring or buckle or pendants or knots? Or in what shape was the almighty gold transformed that has bribed you so much in his favour? Indeed, madam. The last bribe I had from the captain was only a small piece of Flanders lace, for a cap. Hey, Flanders lace is a constant present from officers to their women. They every year bring over a cargo of lace to cheat the king of his duty and his subjects of their honesty. They only barter one sort of prohibited goods for another, madam. Has any of them been bartering with you, Mrs. Pert, that you talk so like a trader? One would imagine, madam, by your concern for Worthy's absence, that you should use him better when he's with you. Who told you, pray, that I was concerned for his absence? I'm only vexed that I have nothing said to me these two days, as one may love the treason and hate the traitor. Oh... Here comes another captain, and a rogue that has the confidence to make love to me. But indeed, I don't wonder at that, when he has the assurance to fancy himself a fine gentleman. Aside. If he should speak of the vaccination, I should be ruined. Enter Brazen. True to the touch, Faith. Madam, I am your humble servant and all that, madam. A fine river, this same Severn. Do you love fishing, madam? Tis a pretty melancholy amusement for lovers. I'll go and buy hooks and lines presently, for you must know, madam, that I have served in Flanders against the French, in Hungary against the Turks, and in Tangier against the Moors, and I was never so much in love before. And split me, madam, in all the campaigns I ever made, I have not seen so fine a woman as your ladyship. 
and from all the men I ever saw I never had so fine a compliment. But you soldiers are the best bred man, that we must allow. Some of us, madam, but there are brutes among us too, very sad brutes. For my own part I have always had the good luck to prove agreeable. I have had very considerable offers, madam. I might have married a German princess, worth fifty thousand crowns a year, but her stove disgusted me. The daughter of a Turkish bashaw fell in love with me too, when I was a prisoner among the infidels. She offered to rob her father of his treasure, and make her escape with me. But I don't know how, my time was not come. Hanging and marriage, you know, go by destiny. Fate had reserved for me a Shropshire lady, worth twenty thousand pounds. Do you know any such person, madam? Aside. Extravagant coxcomb. To be sure, a great many ladies of that fortune would be proud of the name of Mrs. Brazen. Nay, for that matter, madam, there are women of very good quality of the name of Brazen. Enter Worthy. Oh, are you there, gentlemen? Come, Captain, we'll walk this way. Give me your hand. My hand, heart, blood, and guts are at your service. Mr. Worthy, your servant, my dear. Exit, leading Melinda. Death and fire, this is not to be born. Enter Plume. No more it is, Faith. What? The march beer at the Raven. I've, I've been doubly serving the king, raising men, and raising the excise. Recruiting and elections are rare friends to the excise. You aren't drunk. No, no, whimsical only. I could be mighty foolish, and fancy myself mighty witty. Reason still keeps its throne, but it nods a little, that's all. Then you're just fit for a frolic. Just so. Then recover me that vessel from that tangerine. She's well rigged, but how is she manned? <laughs> By Captain Brazen, that I told you of today. She is called the Melinda, a first rate, I can assure you. She sheared off with him just now, on purpose to affront me. But according to your advice, I would take no notice, because I would seem to be above a concern for her behavior. But have a care of a quarrel. No, no, I never quarrel with anything in my cups, but an oyster wench, or a cookmaid. And if they be civil, I knock them down. <laughs> but hark you, my friend, I'll make love, and I must make love. I'll tell you what. I'll make love like a platoon. Platoon? How's that? I'll kneel, stoop, and stand, Faith. Most ladies are gained by platooning. Here they come. I must leave you. Exit. So, now must I look as sober and demure as a whore at a christening. Enter Brazen and Melinda. Who's that, madam? A brother officer of yours, I suppose, sir? Ay. To Plume. My dear. My dear. Run and embrace. My dear boy, how is't? Your name, my dear. If I be not mistaken, I have seen your face. I never saw yours in my life, my dear. But there's a face well known as the sun's that shines on all, and is by all adored. Have you any pretensions, sir? Pretensions? That is, sir, have you ever served abroad? I have served at home, sir, for ages served this cruel fare. And that will serve the turn, sir. So, between the fool and the rake, I shall bring a fine spot of work upon my hands. Will you fight for the lady, sir? No, sir, but I'll have her notwithstanding. Thou peerless princess of Salopian plains, envied by nymphs and worshipped by the swains. Oon, sir, not fight for her. Prithee be quiet. I shall be out. Behold how humbly does the seven glide to greet thee, princess of the seven side. Don't mind him, madam. If he were not so well dressed, I should take him for a poet. But I'll show you the difference presently. Come, madam, we'll place you between us, and now the longest sword carries her. Draws. Enter Worthy. Melinda shrieking. 
Oh, Mr. Worthy, save me from these madmen. Exit with Worthy. Ha ha ha! Why don't you follow, sir, and fight the bold ravisher? No, sir, you are my man. I don't like the wages. I won't be your man. Then you're not worth my sword. No. Pray, what did it cost? It cost me twenty pistoles in France, and my enemies thousands of lives in Flanders. Then they had a dear bargain. Enter Sylvia, in man's apparel. Save ye, save ye, gentlemen. My dear, I'm yours. Do you know the gentleman? No, but I will presently. Your name, my dear? Wilful, Jack Wilful, at your service. What? The Kentish Wilfuls, or those of Staffordshire? Both, sir, both. I'm related to all the Wilfuls in Europe, and I'm head of the family at present. Do you live in the country, sir? Yes, sir, I live where I stand. I have neither home, house, or habitation beyond this spot of ground. What are you, sir? A rake. In the army, I presume? No, but I intend to list immediately. Look ye, gentlemen, he that bids the fairest has me. Sir, I'll prefer you. I'll make you a corporal this minute. Corporal? I'll make you my companion. You shall eat with me. You shall drink with me. Then you shall receive your pay and do no duty. Then you must make me a field officer. Fo, fo, fo. I'll do more than all this. I'll make you a corporal and give you a brevet for sergeant. Can you read and write, sir? Yes. Then your business is done. I'll make you chaplain to the regiment. Your promises are so equal that I'm at a loss to choose. There is one plume that I hear much commended in town. Pray, which of you is Captain Plume? I am Captain Plume. No, no, I am Captain Plume. Heyday. Captain Plume, I'm your servant, my dear. Captain Brazen, I'm yours. Aside. The fellow dares not fight. Enter Kite. Sir, if you please. Goes to whisper Plume. No, no, there's your captain. Captain Plume, your sergeant has got so drunk he mistakes me for you. He's an incorrigible sot. Here, my Hector of Holborn, here's forty shillings for you. I forbid the bans. Look, ye friend, you shall list with Captain Brazen. I will see Captain Brazen hanged first. I will list with Captain Plume. I am a free-born Englishman and will be a slave in my own way. To Brazen. Look ye, sir, will you stand by me? I warrant you, my lad. Then I will tell you, Captain Brazen. To Plume. That you are an ignorant, pretending, impudent coxcomb. Ay, ay, a sad dog. A very sad dog. Give me the money, noble Captain Plume. Then you won't list with Captain Brazen? I won't. Never mind him, child. I'll end the dispute presently. Hark ye, my dear. Takes Plume to one side of the stage, and entertains him in dumb show. Sir, he in the plain coat is Captain Plume. I am his sergeant, and will take my oath on What? You a sergeant kite? At your service. Then I would not take your oath for a farthing. A very understanding youth of his age. But I see a storm coming. Now, Sergeant, I shall see who is your captain by your knocking down the other. My captain scorns assistance, sir. How dare you contend for anything and not dare to draw your sword? But you are a young fellow and have not been much abroad. I excuse that. But prithee, resign the man. Prithee do. You are a very honest fellow. You lie. And you are the son of a whore. Draws, and makes up to brazen. Hold, hold. Retiring. Did you not refuse to fight for the lady? I always do. But for a man I'll fight knee-deep, so you lie again. Plume and brazen fight a traverse or two about the stage. Sylvia draws, and is held by Kite, who sounds to arms with his mouth, takes Sylvia in his arms, and carries her off the stage. Hold, where's the man? Gone. Then what do we fight for? Puts up. Now let's embrace, my dear. With all my heart, my dear. Putting up. 
I suppose Kite has listed him by this time. Embraces. You are a brave fellow. I always fight with a man before I make him my friend, and if once I find he will fight, I never quarrel with him afterwards. And now I'll tell you a secret, my dear friend. That lady we frightened out of the walk just now I found in bed this morning so beautiful, so inviting. I presently lock the door, but I'm a man of honour. But I believe I shall marry her nevertheless. Her twenty thousand pounds, you know, will be a pretty conveniency. I had an assignation with her here, but your coming spoiled my sport. Curse you, my dear, but don't do so again. No, no, my dear. Men are my business at present. Exuant. End of Act Three. Act Four of The Recruiting Officer by George Parkahar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fourth. Scene One. The Walk. Enter Rose and Bullock. Meeting. Where have you been, you great booby? You were always out of the way in the time of preferment. Preferment? Who should prefer me? I would prefer you. Who should prefer a man but a woman? Come, throw away that great club, hold up your head, cock your hat and look big. Oh, Rose, Rose. I fear somebody will look big sooner than folk think of. Here has been Cartwheel, your sweetheart. What will become of him? Look ya, I'm a great woman and will provide for my relations. I told the captain how finely he played upon the tabor and pipe, so he sat him down for drum major. Nay, sister, why did you not keep that place for me? You know I have always loved to be a drumming, if it were but on a table, or on a quart pot. Enter Sylvia. Had I but a commission in my pocket, I fancy my breeches would become me as well as any ranting fellow of them all, for I take a bold step, a rakish toss, and an impudent air to be the principal ingredients in the composition of a captain. What's here? Rose, my nurse's daughter. I'll go and practice. Come, child, kiss me at once. Kisses her. And her brother, too. Well, honest dung-fork, do you know the difference between a horse and a cart, and a cart-horse, eh? I presume that your worship is a captain. By your clothes and your courage. Suppose I were. Would you be contented to list, friend? No, no. Though your worship be a handsome man, there be others as fine as you. My brother is engaged to Captain Plume. Plume? Do you know Captain Plume? Yes, I do. And he knows me. He took the ribbons out of his shirt sleeves and put them into my shoes. See there? I can assure you that I can do anything with the captain. That is, in a modest way, sir. Have a care what you say, Rose. Don't shame your parentage. Nay, for that matter, I am not so simple as to say that I can do anything with the captain but what I may do with anybody else. So, and pray, what do you expect from this captain, child? I expect, sir. I expect, uh, but he ordered me to tell nobody. But suppose he should propose to marry me? You should have a care, my dear. Men will promise anything beforehand. I know that, but he promised to marry me afterwards. Wounds, rouse, what have you said? Afterwards? After what? After I had sold my chickens. I hope there's no harm in that. Enter Plume. What, Mr. Wilful, so close with my market woman? I'll try if he loves her. Close, sir, I, and closer yet, sir. Come, my pretty maid, you and I will withdraw a little. No, no, friend, I ain't done with her yet. Nor have I begun with her, so I have as good a right as you have. Thou a bloody impudent fellow. Sir, I would qualify myself for the service. Hast thou really a mind to the service? 
Yes, sir, so let her go. Pray, gentlemen, don't be so violent. Come, leave it to the girl's own choice. Will you belong to me or to that gentleman? Oh, let me consider. You're both very handsome. Now the natural inconstancy of her sex begins to work. Pray, sir, what will you give me? Do not be angry, sir, that my sister should be mercenary, for she's but young. Give thee, child. I'll set thee above scandal. You shall have a coach with six before and six behind, an equipage to make vice fashionable and put virtue out of countenance. For oh, that's easily done. I'll do more for thee, child. I'll buy you a furbelow scarf and give you a ticket to see a play. A play? Wounds! Rose, take the ticket, and let's see the show. Look ye, Captain, if you won't resign, I'll go list with Captain Brazen this minute. Will you list with me if I give up my title? I will. Take her. I'll change a woman for a man at any time. I have heard before, indeed, that you captains used to sell your men. Pray, Captain, do not send Rose to the Western Indies. Ha, ha, ha! West Indies! No, no, my honest lad, give me thy hand. Nor you nor she shall move a step farther than I do. This gentleman is one of us, and will be kind to you, Mrs. Rose. But will you be so kind to me, sir, as the captain would? I can't be altogether so kind to you. My circumstances are not so good as the captain's, but I'll take care of you upon my word. Aye, aye, we'll all take care of her. She shall live like a princess, and her brother here shall be... What would you be? Oh, sir, if you had not promised a place of drum major... Aye, that is promised. But what think you of barrack-master? You are a person of understanding, and barrack-master you shall be. But what's become of this same cartwheel you told me of, my dear? We'll go fetch him. Come, brother barrack-master. We shall find you at home, noble captain. Excellent Rose and Bullock. Yes, yes, and now, sir, here are your forty shillings. Captain Plume, I despise your listing money. If I do serve, tis purely for love, of that wench, I mean. Now let me beg you to lay aside your recruiting airs, put on the man of honour, and tell me plainly what usage I must expect when I am under your command. Your usage will chiefly depend upon your behaviour. Only this you must expect, that if you commit a small fault, I will excuse it. If a great one, I'll discharge you. For something tells me I shall not be able to punish you. And something tells me that if you do discharge me, it will be the greatest punishment you can inflict. For were we this moment to go upon the greatest dangers in your profession, they would be less terrible to me than to stay behind you. And now, your hand, this lists me. And now, you are my captain. Your friend? Steth, there's something in this fellow that charms me. One favour I must beg. This affair will make some noise, and I have some friends that would censure my conduct if I threw myself into the circumstance of a private sentinel of my own head. I must therefore take care to be impressed by the Act of Parliament. You shall leave that to me. What you please as to that. Will you lodge at my quarters in the meantime? No, no, Captain, you forget Rose. She's to be my bedfellow, you know. I had forgot. Pray be kind to her. Excellent, severally. Enter Melinda and Lucy. You are thoughtful, madam. Am I not worthy to know the cause? Oh, Lucy, I can hold my secret no longer. You must know that hearing of a famous fortune teller in town, I went disguised to satisfy a curiosity which has cost me dear. The fellow is certainly the devil, or one of his bosom favourites. He has told me the most surprising things of my past life. Things past, madam, can hardly be reckoned surprising, because we know them already. Did he tell you anything surprising that was to come? One thing very surprising. He said I should die a maid. Die a maid? Come into the world for nothing. Dear madam, if you should believe him, it might come to pass. For the bear thought aunt might kill one in four and twenty hours. And did you ask him any questions about me? You? 
why i passed for you so tis i that am to die a maid aside but the devil was a liar from the beginning he can't make me die a maid i've put it out of his power already i do but jest i would have passed for you and called myself lucy but he presently told me my name my quality my fortune and gave me the whole history of my life he told me of a lover i had in this country and described worthy exactly but in nothing so well as in his present indifference i fled to him for refuge here to-day he never so much as encouraged me in my fright but coldly told me that he was sorry for the accident because it might give the town cause to censure my conduct excused his not waiting on me home made me a careless bow and walked off Death, i could have stabbed him or myself twas the same thing yonder he comes oh i will so use him don't exasperate him consider what the fortune teller told you men are scarce and as times go it is not impossible for a woman to die a maid enter worthy no matter I find she's warned. I must strike while the iron is hot. You've a great deal of courage, madame, to venture into the walks where you were so lately frightened. And you have a quantity of impudence to appear before me that you so lately have affronted. I had no design to affront you, nor appear before you either, madame. I left you here because I had business in another place, and came hither thinking to meet another person since you find yourself disappointed i hope you'll withdraw to another part of the walk the walk is broad enough for us both they walk by one another he with his hat cocked she fretting and tearing her fan he offers her his box she strikes it out of his hand while he is gathering it up brazen enters and takes her round the waist she cuffs him what here before me my dear what means this insolence to brazen are you mad don't you see mr worthy oh no no i'm struck blind worthy also well turned oh my mistress has wit at her fingers ends madam i ask your pardon tis our way abroad mr worthy you're the happy man I don't envy your happiness very much, if the lady can afford no other sort of favours than what she has bestowed upon you. I'm sorry the favour miscarried, for it was designed for you, Mr. Worthy, and be assured tis the last and only favour you must expect at my hands. Captain, I ask your pardon. Exit with Lucy. I grant it. You see, Mr. Worthy, twas only a random shot, it might have taken off your head as well as mine courage my dear tis the fortune of war but the enemy has thought fit to withdraw i think withdraw ons sir what do you mean by withdraw i'll show you exit she's lost irrevocably lost and plume's advice has ruined me it's death why should i that knew her haughty spirit be ruled by a man that's a stranger to her pride Enter Plume. Ha! <laughs> a battle royal! Don't frown so, man. She's your own, I'll tell you. I saw the fury of her love in the extremity of her passion. The wildness of her anger is a certain sign that she loves you to madness. That rogue kite began the battle with abundance of conduct and will bring you off victorious. My life on't. He plays his part admirably. But what could be the meaning of Brazen's familiarity with her? You are no logician if you pretend to draw consequences from the actions of fools. Whim, unaccountable whim, hurries them on, like a man drunk with brandy before ten o'clock in the morning. But we lose our sport. Kite has opened above an hour ago. Let's away. Excellent. Scene two. A chamber, a table with books and globes. Kite disguised in a strange habit, sitting at a table. Kite rises. By the position of the heavens, gain from my observation upon these celestial globes, 
I find that Luna was a tide waiter, Sol a surveyor, Mercury a thief, Venus a whore, Saturn an alderman, Jupiter a rake, and Mars a sergeant of grenadiers. And this is a system of Kite the conjurer. Enter Plume and Worthy. Well, what success? I have sent away a shoemaker and a tailor already. One's to be a captain of marines, and the other a major of dragoons. I am to manage them at night. Have you seen the lady, Mr. Worthy? Ay, but it won't do. Have you showed her her name that I tore off from the bottom of the letter? No, sir. I reserve that for the last stroke. What letter? One that I would not let you see, for fear that you should break windows in good earnest. Here, Captain, put it into your pocket-book, and have it ready upon occasion. Knocking at the door. Officers, to your post. Tycho, mind the door. Excellent plume and worthy. Servant opens the door. Enter Melinda and Lucy. Tycho, chairs for the ladies. Don't trouble yourself. We shan't stay, doctor. Your ladyship is to stay much longer than you imagine. For what? For a husband. To Lucy. For your part, madam, you won't stay for a husband. Pray, doctor, do you converse with the stars or the devil? With both. When I have the destinies of men in search, I consult the stars. When the affairs of woman come under my hands, I advise with my t'other friend. And have you raised the devil upon my account? Yes, madam, and he's now under the table. Oh, heavens protect us! Dear madam, let's be gone. If you be afraid of him, why do you come to consult him? Don't fear, fool. Do you think, sir, that because I'm a woman I'm to be fooled out of my reason, or frighted out of my senses? Come, show me this devil. He is a little busy at present, but when he has done he shall wait on you. What is he doing? Writing your name in his pocket-book. <laughs> my name. Pray, what have you or he to do with my name? Looky, fair lady, the devil is a very modest person. He seeks nobody unless they seek him first. He's chained up like a mastiff, and can't stir unless he be let loose. You come to me to have your fortune told. Do you think, madam, that I can answer you of my own head? No, madam. The affairs of woman are so irregular that nothing less than the devil can give any account of them. Now, to convince you of your incredulity, I'll show you a trial of my skill. Here, you, Cocodemo de Plumo, exert your power. Draw me this lady's name, the word Melinda, in proper letters and characters of her own handwriting. Do it at three motions. One, two, three. Tis done. Now, madam, will you please to send your maid to fetch it? I fetch it. The devil fetch me if I do. My name, in my own handwriting, that would be convincing indeed. Seeing is believing. Goes to the table and lifts up the carpet. Here, Trey. Trey, poor Trey, give me the bone, sirrah. There's your name upon that square piece of paper. Behold! Tis wonderful, my very letters to a tittle. Tis like your hand, madam, but not so like your hand, neither. And now I look nearer, tis not like your hand at all. Here's a chambermaid now will outlie the devil. Looky, madam, they shan't impose upon us. People can't remember their hands no more than they can their faces. Come, madam, let us be certain. Write your name upon this paper, and then we'll compare the two hands. Takes out a paper and folds it. Anything for your satisfaction, madam. Here is pen and ink. Melinda writes. Lucy holds the paper. Let me see it, madam. Tis the same, the very same. Aside. But I'll secure one copy for my own affairs. This is demonstration. Tis so, madam. 
the word demonstration comes from Damon, the father of lies. Well, doctor, I'm convinced. And now, pray, what account can you give of my future fortune? Before the sun has made one course round this earthly globe, your fortune will be fixed for happiness or misery. What? So near the crisis of my fate? Let me see. About the hour of ten tomorrow morning you will be saluted by a gentleman who will come to take his leave of you, being designed for travel. His intention of going abroad is sudden, and the occasion a woman. Your fortune and his are like the bullet and the barrel. One runs plump into the other. In short, if the gentleman travels, he will die abroad, and if he does, you will die before he comes home. What sort of a man is he? Madam, he's a fine gentleman and a lover. That is, a man of very good sense, and a very great fool. How is that possible, doctor? Because, madam, because it is so. A woman's reason is the best for a man's being a fool. Ten o'clock, you say? Ten, about the hour of tea-drinking throughout the kingdom. Here, doctor. Gives money. Lucy, have you any questions to ask? Oh, madam, a thousand. I must beg your patience till another time, for I expect more company this minute. Besides, I must discharge the gentleman under the table. Oh, pray, sir, discharge us first. Tycho, wait on the ladies downstairs. Exuant Melinda and Lucy. Enter Worthy and Plume. Mr. Worthy. You were pleased to wish me joy today. I hope to be able to return the compliment tomorrow. I'll make it the best compliment to you that ever I made in my life, if you do. But must I be a traveller, you say? No farther than the chops of the channel, I presume, sir. That we have concerted already. Knocking hard. Hey, day. You don't profess midwifery, doctor. Away to your ambuscade. Excellent, worthy, and plume. Enter brazen. Your servant, my dear? Stand off. I have my familiar already. Are you bewitched, my dear? Yes, my dear. But mine is a peaceable spirit and hates gunpowder. Thus I fortify myself. Draws a circle round him. And now, Captain, have a care how you force my lines. Lines? What dost talk of lines? You have something like a fishing rod there, indeed. But I come to be acquainted with you, man. What's your name, my dear? Conundrum. Conundrum? Rat me. I knew a famous doctor in London of your name. Where were you born? I was born in algebra. Algebra? Tis no country in Christendom, I'm sure, unless it be some place in the highlands in scotland right i told you i was bewitched so i am my dear i am going to be married i have had two letters from a lady of fortune that loves me to madness fits colic spleen and vapours shall i marry her in four and twenty hours i or no certainly god so i or no but I must have the year and the day of the month when these letters were dated. Why, you old bitch! Did you ever hear of love letters dated with the year and day of the month? Do you think B. A. Do are like bank bills? They are not so good, my dear. But if they bear no date, I must examine the contents. Contents? That you shall, old boy. Here they be both. Only the last you received, if you please takes the letter now sir if you please to let me consult my book for a minute i'll send this letter enclosed to you with a determination of the stars upon it to your lodgings with all my heart i must give him puts his hands in his pockets algebra i fancy doctor tis hard to calculate the place of your nativity here gives him money and if I succeed, I'll build a watchtower on the top of the highest mountain in Wales for the study of astrology and the benefit of the conundrums. Exit. 
Enter, plume and worthy. Ho, oh, doctor, that letter's worth a million. Let me see it. And now I have it, I'm afraid to open it. Fool, let me see it. Opening the letter. If she be a jilt, damn her, she is one. There's her name at the bottom on't. How? Then I'll travel in good earnest. By all my hopes, tis Lucy's hand. Lucy's? Certainly. Tis no more like Melinda's character than black is to white. Then tis certainly Lucy's contrivance to draw in brazen for a husband. But you sure tis not Melinda's hand? You shall see. Where's the bit of paper I gave you just now that the devil wrote Melinda upon? Here, sir. Tis plain they are not the same. And is this the malicious name that was subscribed to the letter which made Mr. Balance send his daughter into the country? The very same. The other fragments I showed you just now. But twas barbarous to conceal this so long, and to continue me so many hours in the pernicious heresy of believing that angelic creature could change. Poor Sylvia. Rich Sylvia, you mean, and poor Captain. <laughs> come come friend melinda is true and shall be mine sylvia is constant and may be yours no she's above my hopes but for her sake i'll recant my opinion of her sex by some the sex is blamed without design light harmless censure such as yours and mine sallies of wit and vapours of our wine others the justice of the sex condemn and wanting merit to create esteem would hide their own defects by censuring them but they secure in their all-conquering charms laugh at our vain attempts our false alarms he magnifies their conquests who complains for none would struggle were they not in chains Excellent. end of act four Act Five of The Recruiting Officer by George Farquhar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act the Fifth, Scene One, Justice Balance's House. Enter Balance and Scale. I say, tis not be born, Mr. Balance. Look I, Mr. Scale, for my own part, I shall be very tender in that regard to the officers of the army. I only speak in reference to Captain Plume. For the other spark I know nothing of. Nor can I hear of any body that does. Oh, here they come. Enter Sylvia, Bullock, Rose, Prisoners, and Constable. May it please your worships, we took them in the very act. Re in facta, sir. The gentleman, indeed, behaved himself like a gentleman for he drew his sword and swore, and afterwards laid it down and said nothing. Give the gentleman his sword again. Wait you without. Exuant constable and watch. I am sorry, sir. To Sylvia. To know a gentleman upon such terms that the occasion of our meeting should prevent the satisfaction of an acquaintance. Sir, you need make no apology for your warrant, no more than I shall do for my behaviour. My innocence is upon an equal foot with your authority. Innocence? Have you not seduced that young maid? No, Mr. Goosecap, she seduced me. So she did, I'll swear. For she proposed marriage first. To Rose. What, then you are married, child? Yes, sir, to my sorrow. Who was witness? That was I. I danced through the stocking and spoke jokes by their bedside, I'm sure. Who was the minister? Minister? We are soldiers, and want no minister. They were married by the articles of war. Hold thy prating, fool. Your appearance, sir, promises some understanding. Pray, what does this fellow mean? He means marriage, I think. But that, you know, is so odd a thing that hardly any two people under the sun agree in the ceremony. But among soldiers tis most sacred. Our sword, you know, is our honour that we lay down. The hero jumps over it first, and the Amazon after. Leap, rogue, follow whore. The drum beats a rough, and so to bed. That's all. The ceremony is concise. And the prettiest ceremony, so full of pastime and prodigality. What? Are you a soldier? Aye, that I am. Will your worship lend me your cane? 
and i'll show you how i can exercise take it strikes him over the head to sylvia your name pray sir captain pinch i cock my hat with a pinch i take snuff with a pinch pay my whores with a pinch in short i can do anything at a pinch but fight and pray sir what brought you into shropshire a pinch sir i know you country gentlemen want wit and you know that we town gentlemen want money and so i understand you sir enter constable here constable take this gentleman into custody till further orders pray your worship don't be uncivil to him for he did me no hurt he's the most harmless man in the world for all he talks so come come child i'll take care of you what gentlemen rob me of my freedom and my wife at once tis the first time they ever went together hark i constable whispers him it shall be done sir come along sir Excellent constable bullock and sylvia come mr scale we'll manage to spark presently Excellent. scene two the market-place enter plume and kite a baker a tailor a smith butchers carpenters and journeymen shoemakers in all thirty-nine i believe the first colony planted in virginia had not more trades in their company than i have in mine the butcher sir will have his hands full for we have two sheep stealers among us i hear of a fellow too committed just now for stealing of horses we'll dispose of him among the dragoons have we never a poulterer among us yes sir the king of the gypsies is a very good one he has an excellent hand at a goose or a turkey here's captain brazen sir i must go look after the men enter brazen reading a letter um, 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 the canonical hour um, um, very well oh my dear plume give me a bus half a score if you will my dear what hast got in thy hand child tis a project for laying out a thousand pounds were it not requisite to project first how to get it in you can't imagine my dear that i want twenty thousand pounds i have spent twenty times as much in the services but if this twenty thousand pounds should not be in specie what twenty thousand hark ye whispers married presently we're to meet about half a mile out of town at the waterside and so forth reads for fear i should be known by any of worthy's friends you must give me leave to wear my mask till after the ceremony which will make us for ever yours look ye there my dear dog shows the bottom of the letter to plume melinda and by this light her own hand once more if you please my dear her hand exactly just now you say this minute i must be gone have a little patience and i'll go with you no no i see a gentleman coming this way that may be inquisitive tis worthy do you know him by sight only have a care the very eyes discover secrets exit enter worthy to boot and saddle captain you must mount whip and spur worthy or you won't mount but i shall melinda and i are agreed she's gone to visit sylvia we are to mount and follow and could we carry a parson with us who knows what might be done for us both don't trouble your head melinda has secured a parson already already do you know more than i yes i saw it under her hand brazen and she are to meet half a mile hence at the waterside they're to take boat i suppose to be ferried over to the elysian fields if there be any such thing in matrimony i parted with melinda just now she assured me she hated brazen and that she resolved to discard lucy for daring to write letters to him in her name nay nay there's nothing of lucy in this i tell you i saw melinda's hand as surely as this is mine but i tell you she's gone this minute to justice balance's country house but i tell you she's gone this minute to the waterside enter a servant to worthy madam melinda has sent word that you need not trouble yourself to follow her because her journey to justice balances is put off and she's gone to take the air another way how her journey put off that is her journey was a put off to you tis plain plain 
But how, where, when is she to meet Brazen? Just now I tell you half a mile hence, at the waterside. Up or down the water? That I don't know. I'm glad my horses are ready. I shall return presently. Exit. You'll find me at the hall. The justices are sitting by this time, and I must attend them. Exit. Scene 3. A Court of Justice. Balance, scale, and scruple upon the bench. Constable, kite, mob. Kite and constable advance. Pray, who are those honorable gentlemen upon the bench? He in the middle is Justice Balance. He on the right is Justice Scale. And he on the left is Justice Scruple. And I am Mr. Constable. Four very honest gentlemen. Oh, dear sir, I am your most obedient servant. Saluting the constable. I fancy, sir, that your employment and mine are much the same. For my business is to keep people in order, and if they disobey, to knock them down. And then we are both staff officers. Nay, I'm a sergeant myself, of the militia. Come, brother, you shall see me exercise. Suppose this a musket. Now I'm shouldered. Puts his staff on his right shoulder. I, you are shouldered pretty well for a constable's staff, but for a musket you must put it on the other shoulder, my dear. That's so, that's true. Come, now give the word of command. Silence. Aye, aye, so we will. We will be silent. Silence, you dog, silence! Strikes him over the head with his halbert. That's the way to silence a man with a witness. What do you mean, friend? Only to exercise you, sir. Your exercise differs so much from ours that we shall never agree about it. If my own captain had given me such a rap, I'd taken the law to him. Enter Plume. Captain, you are welcome. Gentlemen, I thank you. Come, honest captain, sit by me. Plume ascends and sits upon the bench. Now, produce your prisoners. Here, that fellow there, set him up. Mr. Constable, what have you to say against this man? I've nothing to say against him, and please you. No, what made you bring him hither? I don't know, and please your worship. Did not the contents of your warrant direct you what sort of men to take up? I can't tell you, and please you. I can't read. A well, very pretty constable, truly. I find we have no business here. May it please the worshipful bench. I desire to be heard in this case, as being the counsel for the king. Come, sergeant, you shall be heard, since nobody else will speak. We won't come here for nothing. This man is but one man. The country may spare him, and the army wants him. Besides, he's cut out by nature for a grenadier. He's five feet ten inches high. He shall box, wrestle, or dance the Cheshire round with any man in the country. He gets drunk every Sabbath day, and he beats his wife. You lie, sirrah, you lie. And please, your worship, he's the best-natured, painstaking man in the parish, witness my five poor children. A wife and five children? You constable, you rogue, how dost you impress a man that has a wife and five children? Discharge him, discharge him. Hold, gentlemen. Hark I, friend, how do you maintain your wife and five children? They live upon wild fowl and venison, sir. The husband keeps a gun and kills all the hares and partridges within five miles round. A gun? Nay, if he be so good at gunning, he shall have enough on't. He may be of use against the French, for he shoots flying to be sure. But his wife and children, Mr. Balance. Ay, ay, that's the reason you would send him away. You know I have a child every year, and you are afraid that they should come upon the parish at last. Look you there, gentlemen. The honest woman has spoke it at once. The parish had better maintain five children this year than six or seven the next. That fellow upon this high feeding may get you two or three beggars at a birth. Look ye, Mr. Captain, the parish shall get nothing by sending him away, for I won't lose my teeming time if there be a man left in the parish. Send that woman to the house of correction. And the man? I'll take care of him, if you please. Takes him down. Here, you constable, the next. Set up that black-faced fellow. He has a gunpowder look. What can you say against this man, constable? Nothing but that he's a very honest man. Pray, gentlemen, let me have one honest man in my company, for the novelty's sake. What are you, friend? 
a collier, a work in the coal pits. Look here, gentlemen, this fellow has a trade, and the act of parliament here expresses that we are to impress no man that has any visible means of a livelihood. May it please your worship, this man has no visible means of a livelihood, for he works underground. Well said, Kite. Besides, the army wants miners. Right, and had we an order of government for it, we could raise you in this in the neighbouring county of Stafford, five hundred colliers that would run you underground like moles and do more service in a siege than all the miners in the army. Well, friend, what have you to say for yourself? I'm married. Lack a day. So am I. Here's my wife, poor woman. Are you married, good woman? I'm married in conscience. May it please your worship? She's with child in conscience. Who married you, mistress? My husband. We agreed that I should call him husband to avoid passing for a whore, and that he should call me wife to shun going for a soldier. A very pretty couple. What say you, Mr. Kite? Will you take care of the woman? Yes, sir. She shall go with us to the seaside, and there, if she has a mind to drown herself, we'll take care nobody shall hinder her. Here, constable, bring in my man. Exit constable. Now, Captain, I'll fit you with a man such as you never listed in your life. Enter Constable and Sylvia. Oh, my friend Pinch, I am very glad to see you. Well, sir, and what then? What then? Is that your respect to the bench? Sir, I don't care a farthing for you, nor your bench neither. Look here, gentlemen, that's enough. He's a very impudent fellow and fit for a soldier. A notorious rogue, I say, and very fit for a soldier. A whore, master, I say, and therefore fit to go. What think you, Captain? I think he's a very pretty fellow, and therefore fit to serve. Me, for a soldier? Send your own lazy, lubberly sons at home, fellows that hazard their necks every day in the pursuit of a fox, yet dare not peep abroad to look an enemy in the face. May it please your worships, I have a woman at the door to swear a rape against this rogue. Is it your wife or daughter, booby? Pray, Captain, read the Articles of War. We'll see him listed immediately. Plume. Reads Articles of War, Against Mutiny and Desertions, etc. Hold, sir. Once more, gentlemen, have a care what you do, for you shall severely smart for any violence you offer me. And you, Mr. Balance, I speak to you particularly, you shall heartily repent it. Look ye, young spark, say but one word more, and I'll build a horse for you as high as the ceiling and make you ride the most tiresome journey that ever you made in your life. You have made a fine speech, good Captain Huffcap, but you had better be quiet. I shall find a way to cool your courage. Pray, gentlemen, don't mind him. He's distracted. Tis false. I am descended of as good a family as any in your county. My father is as good a man as any upon your bench, and I am heir to twelve hundred pounds a year. He's certainly mad. Pray, Captain, read the articles of war. Hold once more. Pray, Mr. Balance, to you I speak. Suppose I were your child, would you use me at this rate? No faith. Were you mine, I would send you to Bedlam first, and into the army afterwards. But consider my father, sir. He's as good, as generous, as brave, as just a man as ever served his country. I'm his only child. Perhaps the loss of me may break his heart. He's a very great fool, if it does. Captain, if you don't list him this minute, I'll leave the court. Kite, do you distribute the levy money to the men, while I read? Aye, sir. Silence, gentlemen. Plume reads the Articles of War. Very well. Now, Captain, let me beg the favour of you not to discharge this fellow, upon any account whatsoever. Bring in the rest. There are no more, and please your worship. No more? There were five two hours ago. Tis true, sir, but this rogue of a constable let the rest escape, for a bribe of eleven shillings a man, because he said the act allowed him but ten, so the odd shilling was a clear gain. How? Gentlemen, he offered to let me go away for two guineas, but I had not so much about me. This is truth, and I am ready to swear it. And I'll swear it. Give me the book. Tis for the good of the service. May it please your worship, I gave him half a crown to say that I was an honest man. But now, since that your worships have made me a rogue, I hope I shall have my money again. "'Tis my opinion that this constable be put into the captain's hand, and if his friends don't bring four good men for his ransom by to-morrow night, captain, you shall carry him to Flanders.' "'Agreed, agreed.' "'Agreed, agreed.' 
mr kite take the constable into custody ay ay sir to the constable will you please to have your office taken from you or will you handsomely lay down your staff as your betters have done before you constable drops his staff come gentlemen there needs no great ceremony in adjourning this court captain you shall dine with me come mr militia sergeant i shall silence you now i believe without your taking the law of me Excellent. scene four a room in balance's house enter balance and steward we did not miss her till the evening sir and then searching for her in the chamber that was my young master's we found her clothes there but the suit that your son left in the press when he went to london was gone the white trimmed with silver the same you hadn't told that circumstance to anybody to none but your worship and be sure you don't go into the dining-room and tell captain plume that i beg to speak with him i shall exit was ever man so imposed upon i had her promise indeed that she would never dispose of herself without my consent i have consented with a witness given her away as my act and my deed and this i warrant the captain thinks will pass no i shall never pardon him the villainy first of robbing me of my daughter and then the mean opinion he must have of me to think that i would be so wretchedly imposed upon her extravagant passion might encourage her in the attempt but the contrivance must be his i'll know the truth presently enter plume pray captain what have you done with your young gentleman soldier he's at my quarters i suppose with the rest of my men does he keep company with the common soldiers no he's generally with me he lies with you i presume no faith the young rogue fell in love with rose and has lain with her i think since she came to town so that between you both rose has been finely managed upon my honour sir she had no harm from me all's safe i find now captain you must know that the young fellow's impudence in court was well grounded he said i should heartily repent his being listed and so i do from my soul ay for what reason because he is no less what he said he was born of as a good family as any in this county and he is the heir to twelve hundred pounds a year i'm very glad to hear it for i wanted but a man of that quality to make my company a perfect representative of the whole commons of england won't you discharge him not under a hundred pounds sterling you shall have it for his father is my intimate friend then you shall have him for nothing nay sir you shall have your price not a penny sir i value an obligation to you much above an hundred pounds perhaps sir you shan't repent your generosity will you please to write his discharge in my pocket-book gives his book in the meantime we'll send for the gentleman who waits there enter steward go to the captain's lodging and inquire for mr wilful tell him his captain wants him here immediately sir the gentleman's below at the door inquiring for the captain bid him come up here's the discharge sir sir i thank you aside tis plain he had no hand in it enter sylvia i think captain you might have used me better than to leave me yonder among your swearing drunken crew and you mr justice might have been so civil as to have invited me to dinner for i have eaten with as good a man as your worship sir you must charge our want of respect upon our ignorance of your quality but now you are at liberty i have discharged you discharged me yes sir and you must once more go home to your father my father then i am discovered oh sir kneeling i expect no pardon pardon no no child your crime shall be your punishment here captain i deliver her over to the conjugal power for her chastisement since she will be a wife be your husband a very husband when she tells you of her love upbraid her with her folly be moodishly ungrateful because she has been unfashionably kind and use her worse than you would anybody else because you can't use her so well as she deserves and are you sylvia in good earnest earnest i have gone too far to make it a jest sir and do you give her to me in good earnest if you please to take her sir why then i have saved my legs and arms and lost my liberty secure from wounds i am prepared for the gout farewell subsistence and welcome taxes sir my liberty and the hope of being a general are much dearer to me than your twelve hundred pounds a year but to your love madam i resign my freedom and to your beauty my ambition greater in obeying at your feet than commanding at the head of an army 
Enter Worthy. I am so sorry to hear, Mr. Balance, that your daughter is lost. So am not I, sir, since an honest gentleman has found her. Enter Melinda. Pray, Mr. Balance, what's become of my cousin Sylvia? Your cousin Sylvia is talking yonder with your cousin Plume. How? How? Do you think it strange, cousin, that a woman should change? But I hope you'll excuse a change that has proceeded from constancy. I altered my outside because I was the same within, and only laid by the woman to make sure of my man. That's my history. Your history is a little romantic, cousin, but since success has crowned your adventures, you will have the world on your side, and I shall be willing to go with the tide, providing you'll pardon an injury I offered you in the letter to your father. That injury, madam, was done to me, and the reparation I expect shall be made to my friend. Make Mr. Worthy happy, and I shall be satisfied. A good example, sir, will go a great way. When my cousin is pleased to surrender, tis probable I shan't hold out much longer. Enter Brazen. Gentlemen, I am yours. Madam, I am not yours. I'm glad on it, sir. So am I. You have got a pretty house here, Mr. Laconic. Tis time to write all mistakes. My name, sir, is Balance. Balance? Sir, I am your most obedient. I know your whole generation. Had not you an uncle that was governor of the Leeward Islands some years ago? Did you know him? Intimately, sir. He played at billiards to a miracle. You had a brother, too, that was a captain of a fire ship. Poor Dick. He had the most engaging way with him of making punch. And then his cabin was so neat. But his poor boy Jack was the most comical bastard. Ho, 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 a pickle dog i shall never forget him have you got your recruits my dear not a stick my dear probably i shall furnish you my dear instead of the twenty thousand pounds you talked of you shall have the twenty brave recruits that i have raised at the rate they cost me my commission i lay down to be taken up by some braver fellow that has more merit and less good fortune whilst I endeavour by the example of this worthy gentleman to serve my king and country at home. With some regret I quit the active field, where glory full reward for life does yield. But the recruiting trade, with all its train of endless plague, fatigue, and endless pain, I gladly quit, with my fair spouse to stay, and raise recruits the matrimonial way. Exit Omnes. End of Act 5 And End of the Recruiting Officer by George Farquhar